kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Ah, amen. All right, welcome all to Wednesday night service. Won't you stand and let us worship together?
Thank you, Lord, for tonight, the awesome privilege that we have to call you our God, the awesome privilege, Lord, that we have to assemble. Lord, and we know, as your word says, that we ought not forsake the assembling of one another, especially, man, as we see that day approaching. And Lord, we pray, Father, that this time would be a blessed time around your word. Be with the man of God tonight, Lord, as he prepares and dispenses a message that you've already uh, worked in through in him. And Lord, we pray, Father, that uh, much would be done here tonight. Lord, be with the kids as they're in uh, their classes. Be with the teachers. Fill them with your spirit, Lord, and help them as they pour into these young lives. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us here in the sanctuary, Father, that we came here tonight prepared, willing, open, and ready to receive what you have for each and every ear and heart tonight. And uh, Lord, we're just going to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise uh, for what it's said and done here tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. Hi, everyone. I'm Joel. Thanks for joining us in the middle of your busy week. We appreciate you choosing to spend some time with us. If you're new to First Bible and aren't sure what to do next or how to get plugged in, text the word CONNECT to 585-332-2010. You can also click the New Here button on our website or scan the QR code in the comments to fill out the connection card. We'd love to get to know you and answer any questions that you might have. We believe that God has a plan for every single person. We can't wait to see what God will do through you right here at First Bible. I like it, Joel. I agree. I think God has a plan and a purpose for every one of our lives. And uh, when we submit ourselves, humble ourselves before him, that's often when he begins to direct our path. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. It is good to see your faces. It's good to sing some songs and worship together a little bit. I'm Pastor Kevin, one of the guys on staff here. They give me a microphone every now and then. Um, you know, I was thinking as we were singing, as Tony and Mateo were singing and, and Jessica was playing the piano, that, boy, we have a talented church, and I appreciate the talents of this church. And when I look on Sundays, I see people using their skills and abilities, and I just rejoice in all of that. And, you know, it blesses me, and uh, how many of y'all get blessed by other people's talents and skills? I, I don't have any vocal or instrumental skills at all. In fact, Mike Ireland and I, we actually subtract from other people's skill set a little bit that. How many, how many, is there any instrumentalists in here? Anybody that uh, plays an instrument of any sort whatsoever? Tell me what instrument you play. Yeah. What is it? Bagpipes. That was not what I expected you to say. Who else had a hand up? Go ahead. Guitar, the piano. Miss Green, you play the violin. I didn't know that. Anybody on this side? Janice? Okay. Fun. Any, any vocalists in here? Denise? Good. Tony? It's an instrument. Nicole, you're, you're an instrumentalist? You're a vocalist? Yeah, a lot of good voices. You know, we'd love to, um, we'd love to develop our Wednesday night uh, instrumental and vocal team. If you have a, um, a gift from God, we would love for you to use it uh, in this way on a Wednesday evening to edify the body of believers, to use your gifts and your skills to encourage and build people up a little bit would be a great big blessing for the... How many of y'all think that'd be a good idea? I'm all for it. Guys, can you turn the house lights up just a little bit? I feel like I can't see people very well. That's a little better. Thank you. Okay, good. Does that work for you too? Okay, good. A couple of announcements I want to go through, uh, and then I have one of my favorite missionaries is going to come and present and preach. Um, fall life groups are starting in some cases or already have started um, you can go to our website, fbbc.info forward slash life groups, and you'll see the different groups. Uh, you can look for your location. Uh, maybe you have children. There's some that do have children, some that don't, don't have, that are children accessible. 
And uh, it'd be a great way to sign up. You say, well, I'm just not connected in this church, and I come in and nobody really knows my name. Well, this is a way to get connected with people. If you want to get connected, you got to plug in, okay? Uh, I'm not going to hold your hand. You've got to get yourself plugged in and do that yourself, okay? Go to that website and do that. First Bible Baptist Church is selling some church merch coming up. I've been told, is this true, Nicole, that it'll be here in November? Is that what it is? Sounds about right, she said, okay? Uh, you can go to our events page there, see some information. There's lots of great stuff that you can purchase. A lot of it is more fall, wintery sort of stuff, um, and it's good quality, stuff that uh, I use myself. It gives you opportunities uh, to kind of take the name of First Bible Baptist Church, and uh, our logo uh, has been a place for you. Essentially, it's an opportunity for you to say, we believe our church would be a great place for you to grow in faith and your relationship with God as well. Hilton Apple Fest is coming up. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers to help out with this. Uh, it is September 30th and October 1st. We have free pumpkins. I think we were told 2,000. We're going to give out 2,000 pumpkins for free at the Hilton Apple Fest. Uh, we give out a, a little informational of the church, and we try to pass out some gospel tracts to go along with those, and we'd like to try to pray with people if they want to do that. Um, it's a good way for us to be in our community and trying to touch people, let people know that we're here. Uh, we will promote our counseling services, our children's ministries, all those kind of things at that. If you're interested in doing some face painting or being at one of those tables, you can sign up there on the website as well. October 1st is coming up soon. It is the first Sunday of October, which means it is Baptism Sunday. Uh, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning you have called upon the name of the Lord, uh, repented of your sins, and by faith trusted him and his finished work for the forgiveness of your sins, then um, the next thing you should do is what we see in the Bible is believer's baptism or water baptism in which you go underwater in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Is this different from infant baptism? The answer is yes, okay? So if you say, well, I was, uh, I was baptized Lutheran, I was baptized Catholic, do I need to be baptized again if I have become a Christian now? And the answer is yes, you should, okay? You say, I'm not sure I understand. Pastor Mike, that handsome fellow in the back, would love to um, meet with you, open up the Bible, and walk you through the Scriptures uh, to give you some understanding of what the Bible says. Obviously, if you have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, essentially you are saying, I want him to lead my life. I want to be a follower of his then following the scripture is following God. That's a good path to be on. Sign up for that, and um, we have an option for both 8.30 and 10.30 services. Uh, we give you some information. We want you to obviously invite your family or friends to be a witness to that wonderful time. Parenting Connection, um, last, last month, or this last time that we did it, was... Fantastic. Jeff, how many did, was it 160? Is that what it was? 160 people signed up to come to that. And, uh, you know, as I was listening and a part of this parenting connection, I thought, I wish 500 people had come to this. It was fantastic. How many all were there? Anybody, did anybody there? Uh, it, it was, I'm sure you could testify as well, just really good um, we're going to be back at it again on October 15th, and there's another selection on November. I'm not sure what the date is on that one, but you can sign up for both of those by going to the events page. It's a free event. Um, there is child care. There is a meal. Uh, really what we're trying to do is help equip parents to be better parents. Um, just a quick raise of your hands. How many of you think are crushing it as parents? Like you're like, man, I am nailing this, okay? That's because you probably don't have kids yet, right? You're like, oh, it's not hard. I mean, what do you got to do, right? Uh, I remember the advice somebody gave to us. You just need to be consistent. Whatever you decide, just be consistent. And like 12 people in a row said that to my wife and I. And we were like, why do people keep saying be consistent, be consistent? Of course we're going to be consistent until you're not, right? 
until bedtime went from 7.30 to 10.30, and, and, and then the idea that you're not going to give any, any sugar or anything like that went right out the window, and, and life moves on, and it's hard to be consistent with discipline and bedtimes and devotions and everything in between. This Parenting Connection is a great way to be equipped to be the best parent that God has called us to be. I'm not sure there's too many other things that has such importance as raising our children uh, in a way that's pleasing unto our Lord. So, amen to that. As I mentioned, uh, one of my favorite people and missionaries is here. Uh, he is uh, Dan Jellowick. His wife is Janice. Why don't you guys stand up for us real quick? Um, they have been missionaries to Zambia, Africa. They are sent out of this church, meaning this church, they were um, trained up. This is their home church. And then we laid our hands on them and uh, promised to support them financially and prayerfully. And they have been faithfully in Africa trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ for the last, is it 10 years, Dan? Is that the number? So Dan is going to come. Uh, him and his wife, they are back from Africa because one of their children is about to get married this weekend, and uh, they wanted to be a part of that sacred event. Uh, and then they'll only be back for a few more weeks after that, and then they'll head back to Africa. So let's give Dan a great big welcome. He's going to present his ministry, and then he's going to preach to us today. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. It's always a great opportunity to be back here. I'm a little ringing here. Am I up too high? A great opportunity, but yet the, well, this is our home field. It's always the most challenging place to ever get up and, and preach at. Um, you always want to be fresh and relevant. And uh, many of you know that I have a tender heart. So sometimes just getting up in front of your, your home people is the hardest thing to do. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is really go through, uh, we, just, we just went back to the field uh, the end of April, so it's only been three and a half months, but what I'd like to do is just kind of take you with some pictures through those last three and a half months and just help you experience some of what, what we go through but let me uh, start it off by really just saying thank you for your prayers. Um, your prayers are, they're humbling. When we come back and somebody says, I pray for you every day. Whew. I know it's only because of the Lord. We are so unworthy but God is worthy. And I tell you, those prayers, you cannot imagine what they do for us and through us there. It is your prayers that have put the hand of God in protection over us, that have blocked the devices, the schemes, the plots of the wicked one, in many different ways. This is, no doubt, spiritual warfare. And it happens here, and sometimes we don't see it here, but if we would just open our eyes, you would see the warfare all around you. There is a small God of this world, and he has one plan, and that is to destroy you, to steal everything from you, to steal your joy, to steal anything good from you, to cause you to fall. That's his only purpose, his full-time job, and he never quits. But we have the victory in Jesus Christ. He cannot touch us unless the Father allows it. And if he does, you have to know the Father has a plan in that. We came back uh, May 1st on the field, and within, I think, a week, uh, we were hosting a medical team uh, at one of our home churches. And uh, it was the first time we've ever hosted a medical team. And 
We are hosting another one this coming May. Um, so if anyone is interested, please contact me. Um, it is a bit of a, uh, we have a, a, a sign-in, we have a triage, we have um, council rooms, we have a pharmacy, and we have the gospel given in, throughout this whole area. And most of these people that go to their local clinic, uh, it pretty much doesn't matter what you have. If you fell and you split your head open and you're bleeding, they'll get the bleeding to stop and then they'll give you ibuprofen. If you uh, had a heart attack and you're revived, they're gonna send you home with ibuprofen. If you had malaria, they might, they might give you malaria medication if they have it. Most of the time they don't. When you get malaria, I've had it at least once. It is one of the worst kind of feelings you can have. And they'll give you ibuprofen, but they won't give you malaria medicine all the time. And you have to live with it. And this ends up killing a lot of people. And you think, malaria meds, how much is a box of malaria meds, Jan? A dollar. A dollar. A dollar. And their clinics don't stock these things. The money's going somewhere, but it's not going to the clinics. And these are the kind of things that we, we deal with day in and day out. Imagine everywhere you went, people are asking you for something. Help them, fix them, heal them. Help their family, help their child. And you're like, who, who am I? What, what could I do? These are the things that we deal with every day. And we just ask God, give us wisdom. What can we do? What do you want to do through us? And how can we do it so you get all the honor and the glory? Because it's not just about giving out medicines or helping someone go to school. It's really about meeting their needs and opening their eyes to the truth of the gospel. We started with uh, uh, this clinic in May. Uh, another missionary friend of ours has been hosting medical clinics and he allowed us to host it this time um, in May. So we get there. This young man was brought in, I think on the third day, he was literally whisked into the church and all of a sudden you see people like whisking by and you're like, what's, what's going on? And, and they're just hanging him and he's just, he's almost comatose and they immediately bring him to the, the back little office of the church and the doctors are going back there and they're trying to, you know, revive him and he's, you know, in and out, he's hallucinating and now he's, he's crying in a way that is so gut-wrenching and everyone in this clinic in our church is hearing it. And the doctors are trying to figure out what's wrong with him. Talk to the, the brother that brought him in. In the meantime, while the doctors are trying to assess what's going on, the other relatives are trying to squirt by and get him to drink some other kind of fluid. We're like, what, what are you giving him? They're like, no, he needs to drink this. Like, whoa, whoa, you can't just give him stuff because we don't know what this is and it may interact or react with the drugs the doctors want to give him. And so they back, back off. And you're like, you cannot give him anything. The doctors must treat him because we don't know what's going to happen here. So the doctors begin treating him. And now these people go in, they try to get him into the back door of the church and try to get him to drink some kind of potion that they've made, some kind of herbal remedy. And who knows what is in it. And I can guarantee you it is not made with clean water. So we've got this fight now. We've got people trying to guard the doors. I thought this guy was going to die. And I'm like, he's going to die in our church. They said he had malaria, came down with it yesterday. They had given him some ibuprofen, and then he just started fever, started going into convulsions, and it looked like he was going catatonic. So, of course, they heard their medical clinic is at our church. 
They rushed him in. Doctors start working on him. Give him some, uh, some meds. They get him stabilized. The first thing we've got to do is get him back to the local clinic because we are just to treat and get them to the clinic with a referral so they can take care of them. They can give them an IV. They can stabilize them. They can admit them for a day or two. So we hire a taxi. And of course, when you've got to hire a taxi in an emergency like this, they're going to charge you four times as much. I'm like, that's ridiculous. It's 10 minutes down the road. And we're like, just, all right, let's just pay this and get this guy to the clinic. Get him to the clinic. I go later in the day and check on him. He's not at the clinic. I said, what happened? Well, they, uh, they sent him home. I said, well, did, did they give him IVs? No, there was actually no one at the clinic when they got there. And somebody came by and says, he's fine. He should just go home. So they sent him back home. By a miracle of God, he survived because of the meds that the doctors gave him. And he came back the next day, looking like this. He came in, and he was talking to everybody, and I'm like, who's this guy? And they're like, he's the one they carried in yesterday. I'm like, no way. <laughs> like, I couldn't even believe it was the same guy. And he was just so thankful that we were there. And it happened to be at the time that we had a medical clinic there. One of the nurses brought her violin. And as they're waiting, we ask them just to play. <laughs> so the kids have never heard or seen a violin. So we said, just let them hear this. And then the, the kids are, they're dancing. <laughs> He's dancing pretty good for the first time ever hearing a violin. And the joy that it brought to these kids' faces was just awesome. Something simple like that can bring joy to a child, to an adult. Something that we just, we take for granted. This young man is 20 years old. His name is Patrick. Patrick lives in the village where we have our uh, Chicoka Bible Baptist Church. They brought Patrick in on an ox cart because he can't walk. He has giantism. I provided a wheelchair for him several years ago, and he got so big he could no longer sit in the wheelchair. And because he sleeps on a grass mat on the floor, and his mom can't move him much, his joints don't bend much. So they put him on an ox cart, and they bring him to us, and they, uh, you can hardly see, but he's sitting in, a, in a, a big wooden chair they had made especially for him. So it's an extra big chair that they can put him in. And he kind of barely sits in it because he's mostly stiff. And they bring him to us and say, fix him. We do everything we can, but it's too late. If he had physical therapy, any physical therapists here? We need to get physical therapists over there, occupational therapists, just to help people understand how they need to keep mobile. Unfortunately, he can't come to church. He can't walk. He's too big for anyone to carry him or several to carry them. They get several men from the village to carry him and put him in the ox cart to bring him to the clinic. So the only thing we can do is I give Patrick a proclaimer a radio Bible in, with Chichewa in English. And he lays on his bed at home and just listens to the Bible because that's about all he can do. But at least he gets to listen to the Bible because of that proclaimer. This little girl was eight years old. She was at one of our, new, our newest church plant in Coodway. And uh, the man almost behind me in the white shirt there, over my left shoulder there, is the father. And I, he's been coming to church for a while. And uh, at one Sunday, 
they said, uh, one of the girls is very sick. So after church, we went to visit her. And she's laying there, and you, you walk in. I mean, imagine, it's like walking behind a curtain. Dark, no windows, no lights. Your eyes have to adjust. You get there, and they're trying to, you know, pull a curtain back, so you let a little bit of light in, and she's just laying there and kind of curled up in a, in a blanket, and you can see she's been sick for about three, four days. And I said, well, what's the problem? They said, her side is swollen. So we look at her side, and I'm like, I'm no doctor, but I'm just wondering if that's like, an appendix or something. I mean, yeah, that's where they always tell you to look. So we get her into the vehicle. We bring her an hour back into town, admit her in the hospital. We check on her the next day. And they haven't done anything but IVs and ibuprofen. And I said, well, how about her side? Has the doctor checked her? No, uh, she's not stabilized yet. So well, when is the doctor going to check her? If you get a little bit too in their face... They'll be like, hey, listen, you, you do it yourself then. So we, we have to be very gentle and gracious as we apply pressure in the right areas to get things done. Four days later, we go and visit. She's withered. She's skinnier. Almost non-responsive. We brought food for her, her father, some fresh clothes for her father because he only had one set of clothes. He's been in for over a week. And we ask, what is the diagnosis? How are they helping her? And they keep saying, well, she's just malnourished. We have to get her nourished before we can do anything. I said, I think she has an infection and, and she needs to be seen immediately. And they're like, well, she's malnourished. A week and a half goes by, two weeks. Still nothing. And she's looking worse. And they say, well, we're going to refer her uh, to Lusaka. Of Zambia. Seven hours away. I said, she's not going to make the trip. Seven hours. Why can't we treat her here? Like, no, we don't, we don't have what she needs. You haven't done anything yet. She goes to Lusaka. And in three days, he passes away. Because they didn't do anything. They neglected her. I think some basic medical care would have helped. I asked the doctors when they got there, because she was in the hospital, I explained, they said, well, it's probably a burst appendix, and she has an infection now raging through her body. And she can't fight it off, and she's certainly malnourished because... She's spending all her energy just trying to fight this infection. And now the mother, we sent the mother and her to Lusaka to the hospital. She dies there. Now we have to decide, do we pay for transport to bring them all the way back and bury her here? Or do they want to bury her in Lusaka? The family decided to bury the child in Lusaka seven hours away. Well, who's going to pay for that? The dad can't even feed the children. The mom had no food. We had to send her with money for food. So they asked the community, can you guys help us? We, we just need money to bury our daughter. They give what they have. They can't feed their children, but they give what they have. And the short come, the shortfall, they come to us. Pastor, could you help us? Of course. How can you say no? Just so they can bury their daughter. She was one of our Sunday school girls. But she'll never be bothered by an infection again because she's with Jesus. This is our June conference. We had, this is a, the man in the green shirt here is Pastor Eric May from uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church in Swansea, New Hampshire. He and another man came out. They taught a three, four-day conference for us. We bring our churches together, and uh, it was, it was uh, just a, a fantastic time. This was his first time ever there, and he was just so blessed, and the people were blessed, and uh, 
I just love it when they come up afterwards and they just said, thank you for bringing them. We learned so much. I never knew about this, or I never knew about that. Sometimes it just takes another preacher to say it a different way for them to get it. We introduced cornhole to them in one of the afternoon fellowships. This was a a very unusual concept to them. And when we explained it and they got it, they are kind of like, okay, get out of the way, let us try it. And pushed us out of the way and they played all afternoon and had such a blast. This was like a highlight of their year. They don't play games like this. They never play games unless it's checkers. So something like this was such a challenge and it brought such camaraderie and fellowship to so many of these guys and seeing some of the elderly men who are so dignified wanting to get in there and play. And it just broke down some of those barriers that opened up and created a greater friendship. This was some of the leaders that had come to the conference. You see the tent off to the side. Uh, Some of the people came from uh, quite a distance away and they sleep in the tent there. That um, We've got several tents for the ministry that when people come from the other churches, they either just sleep in the church uh, because we've got these really nice um, wooden benches that they can sleep on. Um, If sometimes they have a blanket, sometimes they don't, or they can sleep in the tent. So uh, everyone is proud to have their their picture taken. This is Jacoka Bible Baptist Church. This is kind of our meeting center, uh, our main church that we uh, try to run our big conferences from. This has turned into one of my favorite pictures. Um, Jan is uh, teaching Sunday school here, and um, there's a young lady, a missionary there, who has really been gifted by God to write children's stories. Um, Amy Singleton writes these children's books, and she writes them not as a Bible story, but as a moral lesson because she wants this open to everyone in the world and they're available on Amazon. But when she writes them, it's from a personal experience and she uses African animals and makes them little caricatures. And for instance, um, who Jenny the giraffe. Jenny, <clears throat> sorry, Jenny the giraffe visited her uncle's house one time and her uncle hurt her and she didn't know how to deal with it. And as she grows up, she learns how to tell people she was hurt and needs help. I've had adults read this and say, this isn't a children's book because it struck them right in the heart. And she writes these books and now they're translated into Chichewa Uh, So Jan is reading them. Unfortunately, many of the cultural things they do, very ungodly, Uh, many children are hurt by the cultural things they do um, as families. So there's a lot of broken people there, and they're broken from childhood. So these books really help unlock some of that and and help build their courage that they're not the only one and God has created them for something so much better. So Jan practicing her chichewa there, doing a a great job at that, Uh, really reaching the kids. This here... Picking up the song. Yes, Jesus loves me. I found myself singing that song this afternoon. Many of these kids just live in such desperate circumstances. If they have and they understand that love of God, that God, who is our heavenly father, does love us 
because many of them don't know their father. Or if they do, their father is not a good father. So when we talk of God the Father, sometimes they're like, I don't want that. But you explain that God is good. That's where goodness comes from. And they get to understand and know that and start learning some of the Bible stories and see this is the Father I have been longing for all my life. Uh, This is, you can read it there, Chivumbaluzzo. Go ahead and say it. Hey, you guys did good. You are ready to come to Zambia. Chivumbaluzzo Bible Baptist Church. This uh, started two years ago, maybe. Um, Some of the guys going to Chicoka keep asking, when are you going to come and plant a church in our village? I'm like, we're working with them. We don't have time. And you're coming here anyways. And then one Sunday, he says, after church, he says, you need to come to my house to pick up some bags. So I go there, and he brings out these bags, huge bags of peanuts, ground nuts, still in the shell. I said, what is this? He harvested, he harvested them from his field, and he says, this is my tithe. I thought, how sweet is that? He worked a field with his hands. He planted it. He weeded it. He harvested it with his hands. He has maybe 50 bags and he set aside these for his tithe for the church. And I said, this guy gets it. This is why Chivumbaluzzo was started. Because this guy, Vincent, has been going out and telling others about Jesus Christ and that they need to come to church. And all of a sudden, they're saying, well, we're meeting. When are you going to come visit? I come, and they've got a church building. I'm like, well, this is awesome. They did everything totally themselves. They didn't ask a thing from me, which I love, because it's their church, and they understand that. And that's what we're really going for. These guys, the church members hired from taking money from their harvest... You see them running back and forth. They're making bricks. At that point, they had made 20,000 bricks. And they're running back and forth because it's hot and the sun is drying this mud out. And you don't want it to get too dry until you get it into the mold and let it sit out in the sun and dry slowly. And then they'll take those bricks and they'll stack them six feet high, 10 feet wide, 30, 20 feet long with little holes underneath where they'll pack the whole thing with mud and they'll get a fire burning under there and build their own kiln. And these bricks will turn out to be hard red bricks and they're going to build their own church. These guys are really getting it. As I left, they had s- about 60,000 bricks that they had made by hand. And I asked them, how many, what is their goal? And they said they want to get 150,000 bricks to make their church. 150,000 bricks they're going to make by hand. And they're just doing it themselves. I love this kind of attitude. These are the people that we want to reach because these are the ones that can reach more villages out there. This is Benson Sakala. Uh, Benson was 86 years old. A year ago, April, uh, we went to visit him Easter. Um, Colton, were you with us then? Yes. Yes. We went and visited Benson and his family. He said he's never been to church. How many kids did he have, Jan? He had like 11 kids or something that have all died. And now he's got, you know, 
grandkids and great grandkids, but he's never been to church. He's known about church. He's heard different things. And he asked us, what is this you're teaching? I want to know about it. I've heard about this church starting, but I can't go. I can't walk. So we gave him the gospel. We sat around, asked him, answered their questions for a while. Like, any other questions? When can I get saved? Right now. Said, we'll lead you in a prayer if you mean this. We led them. I think all six or seven of them prayed out loud to give their life to Christ. Since then, I have been visiting Benson almost every week, every couple weeks. One of his last questions is, when can I get baptized? Well, we happen to be having baptism the next day. So we picked him up, brought him in our vehicle to Chicoka, and he couldn't even like walk up the stairs. So I had put him on my back, carried him down in, and we baptized him. Since then, we've been visiting him every couple weeks. He's just laying in bed. He's dying. We bring the family food. We bring him some vitamins, some medicines, things, try to get him outside, some clean water, just to try to give him some more hope. The church goes. We sing with him there. We pray. And the poor man is just withering away. And uh, it was a blessing that he had come to Christ. And I had the blessing of preaching at his funeral. I had no idea this many people would be there. They said there was probably five, six, seven hundred people gathered out as, almost as far as I can see. And I got the pr- chance to preach the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. Who knows who would respond to that in their hearts? But because of that, God gave us the opportunity to at least preach to these people. So there we are, bringing his casket to a truck, and they're going to go to the gravesite and bury him. I asked him, what kind of man was he when he was growing up? They said he had a, a, a little shop, and when kids were walking from school to home, and they might be walking for hours, they would always stop by because they were hungry. And he would give them some cookies so they'd have some energy to make it back home. This was a guy God had been searching for. And grace found him. And I was blessed to be a part of that. We had another medical team that was coming uh, in July. We were supposed to be a part of that, helping at another church. Uh, The ministries that we were involved in directly, I was just getting very busy teaching uh, some new leadership classes, reaching some other areas, and I said, I really can't help with the medical team, but you can use our vehicle. Uh, Janice was going to go pick up the medical team at the airport, and uh, you know what, we'll help in any way we can because we know how important it is to get a medical team out there. The first medical team that was in May, we are coming back day one, day two. My vehicle had a blowout, luckily just as we got into town. So one of the young nurses was driving it, she pulled over, we go to get it changed, and there's all this difficulty putting the the spare tire on. And I'm, I'm watching this going, this, this is not rocket science. And, and, and one of the guys is getting very anxious. And he's like, just let me, just let me put this tire on. I'm like, let's, let's just see what's going on. And we look and go, I've got a five stud pattern. And this is a six stud wheel. When I got a flat last year and had to buy an extra spare, they switched my wheel. They kept my alloy wheel and they gave me a steel wheel that looked like it. So that one had more value. I never knew because they just put it up on my vehicle. Now we're stuck and we don't have a spare. 
I have to take the spare off the other truck, send everyone home, we get it set. This medical team is coming in July. And I said, you know what? I don't want to take any risks. Spend the money, buy all brand new tires. Let's make sure everyone's safe. Friday, Janice gets food poisoning. She's supposed to go to the airport on Sunday to pick them up. She is in bed Friday, all day Saturday. I am gone all day Sunday, out preaching. We had a wedding at uh, one another Bush church. So we had somebody come and help take care of Jan during the day. I came back about 5.30. She's like, oh, I'm feeling better. And uh, she goes, I think I'm going to get up. And she comes out of the bedroom, sits in the chair in the kitchen, and I'm going to pass out. Wait. So she's, she's sitting up in the chair, and she's passing out, and I'm trying to yell at her, revive her, and I'm trying to hold her in the chair and, and run out to the door to scream for Ruthie, who is a, 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 a nurse that's staying in our cottage, and I'm holding Jan and I'm trying to scream back and forth. I'm trying to reach the sink to get water to wake her up. And Ruthie's is, is, I can hear her coming. And then Jan, her eyes roll back. She just goes catatonic. It straightens out. It just starts going into convulsions. Lord, what's going on? And she's just, now she starts to get sick. She wakes up, Ruthie runs in. And I'm like, Whoa. Sunday night, Ruthie's like, you got to take her to the clinic. No. We both shout, no. She is not going to the clinic. We are going to heal her here. So we get somebody, we go get some IV bags. We're coming back. They're starting to put IVs into Jan. I get a phone call. It's breaking up. The other missionary that borrowed our vehicle called me. It says the wheel flew off the vehicle on the way back from the airport. And they're still out in the bush, about 40 minutes away from town. They found the, they found the wheel, but of course all the lug nuts are gone. They went to take lug nuts from the other uh, wheels so they can put some on there. All the wheels were loose. And I was doing it to be safe, to buy new tires. And I went to a professional store so it would be done right. Somebody didn't do their job. And we got a medical team coming in to help people that can hear the gospel and can get saved. And you tell me this isn't warfare. All at the same time this happening. Jan's just revived. We're trying to get an IV in her. They call. The truck is okay. No one is hurt. Easy. A truck a tire rolls off the vehicle like that. The vehicle can just overturn. And you've got eight, 10 people in a vehicle like that. It could have been deadly. I go out there. We finally get the, the tire put back on. A lot of damage to the vehicle. Uh, I can't, we can't use the vehicle. This whole two weeks, the medical team is here. So now I'm letting them use a, another vehicle and, and we're trying to you know, make arrangements and everything and working with the police and the insurance. And I go to the police because I have to make a report to file it with the insurance. And they say, oh, you, you have to be fined because you didn't report this that night. I said, you want to fine me and I'm trying to get your help? This is the kind of things that you're dealing with all the time. And you just have to be filled and walk in the spirit and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I need you to guide me through this process. So this vehicle is still at the repair shop, and as of yet, I still don't know if they got the parts in to, to fix this. This is the last uh, Sunday before we came home, uh, New Jerusalem Bible Baptist Church. When we got back in May, they said, uh, you need to come and visit the new church. They've been meeting for a year and a half now, I guess, and uh, I put it on the calendar that we will go that last August, or the last weekend we're there before we come back here. I had no idea what to expect. I go in, and I'm like, there's 65 adults there. I literally was, I was a guest preacher. They ran the whole service. They did everything. And this was 
a young man, not so young anymore, but that got saved at Big Tree Bible Baptist Church that Kevin had planted. And he has been going out riding a bicycle we provided out to different churches to be like an itinerant preacher. And then this church starts in his home village. And they told me when I was there, they said, do you remember these villages? I said, yeah, I've been through here. I don't remember why, but I've been through there. And they said, the word for uh, pastor is Abusa. Yeah, you and Abusa Kelvin, they call him, Abusa Kelvin, uh, you wanted to plant a church here and you started Bible studies and no one came because everyone was saying that these are Satanists. You don't want to listen to what they have to say. So no one would come to our Bible studies because we were Satanists. And they said, but we're using the Bible. Yeah, but that's how they trick you. So people label us as Satanists. So when you try to go into a village and, and preach a message, many of them don't want to come. They don't want to hear you. But God is faithful. God is faithful. He brings the message when the hearts are ready. And there's, there's 65 people there. That woman in the stripes there, I found out she was a visitor. She came for the very first time. That song says, oh, what great love God has for us. I snuck out because I saw all the children leave. They're teaching their own kids. No greater joy than to see your children walk in truth. I love it when I had nothing to do with starting that church, but they get it on their own. They own it. They do it. That's our goal. I want to be able to go out and just train leaders. I'll get to my goals in, in just a minute. This Chizie Secondary School, you'll see the head teacher there. That, oh, no, that's Savannah. Um, this is a public school that's kind of in the middle of where our churches are. It's the, the secondary school is like a junior, senior high. And it's the only one around for 30 miles. So these kids have to walk to get there. And it's not a boarding school. So they're supposed to walk there every day. But certainly you can't walk several hours every day. So they come. They live here. We go. We look at the classroom. And there's 120 girls sleeping on the floor, on the concrete floor. And they have a little duffel bag and a blanket and a change of clothes. And some of them will rent a, rent a room in the nearby village, which makes them very vulnerable. They started with like, uh, I think, 220 kids. Now there are over 360 kids at this school. Not a boarding school, but they sleep there. Two, count them, two pit toilets. 360 kids. And they've been asking us, can you help us? The government won't do anything. We have dug the holes but we don't have the money. So the Lord put it on Jan's heart last year. So we got to do something. I mean, if you don't have even decent facilities, you know the sickness that goes around? Dysentery, cholera. These kids are getting sick. There's no medicine. They're going to go to school to die. So we put a plan together. Here the students are ferrying water from another well, filling up the buckets so they can use the water to mix the cement in the mortar. Now this next one, they're bringing bricks, and I'll explain it only because the wind is really whipping through here. And 
but this was last week they're doing this. So they had the students help out carrying water, carrying bricks. We hired uh, the contractors that are digging the, uh, the pits, the toilets, and will build the structures. These contractors are a group of young guys. I've had the chance uh, to see them come to Christ um, and disciple them. And they have become, they become my brothers. They become my sons. They're my children in the Lord. They love the Lord. And they, when they go out in a job like this, they're going out to the churches. They're the ones preaching. They're the ones teaching. They're the ones reaching and going out. These guys are a bunch of evangelists. And I am so grateful that God put them in my path. A couple years ago, when we were on furlough here, I just continued to pray, God, open up a ministry for me in town. All my ministries are out in the bush. They're an hour away. They're all in Chewa, and I don't know Chewa well. I'm, I'm, I'm in this continual process. But give me someone who maybe understands English that really wants to learn. And God put these boys in my path. And we've got six or eight of them now that uh, we've gone through discipleship. We've got a little uh, a WhatsApp chat every morning. They're sending in encouraging scriptures or some video of someone preaching or something. And uh, the, the name of our, our group is The Big Picture. Because that's where we started, teaching them the big picture. Old Testament, New Testament, surveys, book of Acts, the mysteries of God, going through everything we can in the scripture. And they're asking me, when are you coming back? When are we starting? We need to meet again. I'm excited to go back. We have rented another home in town, closer to where these guys live, that... Uh, a couple of these guys are going to live there. They're going to have their contracting ministry or their contracting business out of there. And this will be a home that we're able to run our Bible studies. We'll be able to go and do, I'll do men's Bible studies. Janice will be able to meet with ladies, teach them ladies Bible studies, maybe even English classes, sewing. So this is a hub that I think the Lord has really allowed us to have in this area, so I'm excited, excited when we get back to start this. Uh, keep this in prayer. Um, this has been Jan's dream for 10 years, and um, to open or help run a cafe. There's no cafes in all of the town of Chapada. Okay, there is one in a, in a grocery store, but they usually don't have coffee or milk. So basically, it's just some chairs. But if we had a cafe where we can bring these Bible studies here and start bringing in new people that God would just bring to us, that we can touch their lives with the gospel. Maybe they're traveling through town. Chapada is kind of this, uh, this gateway that people travel through. And if we had that opportunity that we can do that, um, we would love to do that and really get behind the Zambians running it. That has been her dream. I am slow, I'm patient, and I just keep saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. I want to know God is moving. Last a few months ago, one of our friends said, hey, Jan, have you ever thought about opening a cafe? <laughs> like only every day. And she says, yeah, this town could really use it. You know, our ministry bought all the supplies from a cafe that closed and it's just been in storage. Chairs, tables, coffee machines, and we'd be willing to donate it to you. Okay, maybe it's time. 
We'll see. Maybe we start the cafe out of this home ministry that we're building there. I don't know. God is doing something. I'm excited to see when we go back. I make plans for the next season we're there. I don't know how long this is, whether it's a year or what, but every time you kind of have things planned out, never goes that way. But you always have to have a plan because God always directs it differently. And watch how God opens doors and what we do and just follow along with that. In that, I really have a desire to bring more proclaimers out because many people cannot read. Um, and English study Bibles, like Schofield study Bibles. If anyone has a, a hole, I don't want it in pieces or tattered and torn because they need to keep this, but a study Bible they don't use anymore. Many times we're just on our iPads and do that. But if you've got a study Bible that you don't use and you'd want to donate, please contact me. Uh, I'm going to be putting books and, and buying proclaimers and putting them in a barrel and shipping them probably within the next month or so. Uh, my goal is really to help do conferences maybe two, three times a year, bring people from the States to help train now these leaders that we have and get them really established in the, in the scriptures so they can go out and reach others also. I want to thank you guys, your prayers, your support. Um, those are your ministries. It's because of your faithfulness. I often wonder why have you picked us, God? It doesn't make sense because we don't have those kind of abilities, but we are willing. And God is just looking for people who are willing to go because he gets the honor and the glory from that. Kevin, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dan. What a great presentation. And uh, I think you all have just gotten a good view into some of the rural life there in the eastern province of Zambia. Uh, a lot of the victories, a lot of the spiritual warfare, a lot of the challenges, the hurts that go along with it. Obviously, as Dan speaks, you can hear his heart come out through all of that. Uh, Dan, how much are proclaimer? How much are the proclaimers? So the proclaimers that he's talking about is this, it's this little um, MP3 player with, uh, is, is it both New Testament and Old Testament? So it's, it's, uh, it has a little wind thingy on it. You can just wind it and it'll just play and play. And it also has a little solar panel that you can partially charge it with that so that it doesn't need electricity and it's you know, very sustainable to do that. So uh, one of the benefits of getting these is you can allow villages and homes to have the Bible. For people that can't read the Bible, they're able to still hear the Word of God. How many of y'all appreciate that you have a Bible that you can read on your own? This is a piece of modern technology that allows people that can't read on their own to still hear God's Word. $75 gives uh, villages an opportunity to do that. We want to receive an offering tonight, and uh, that money will go towards helping things like purchase um, Proclaimer Bibles and many other items as well. You see on the screen, there's multiple ways to give. If you are an online giver, uh, you can either select the Wednesday offering or you can select Dan and Dan Jellowick, and the money will get to them. If you are a cash or check giver, you can put that in one of these black boxes in this room on the exits, or you can always mail it into the church as well. Anything that you give from today until next Tuesday, we will make sure gets to the Jellowicks and to continue reaching people that reach people that reach people. So essentially, uh, because this church has sent them out and because this church supports them, a lot of the work that's being done there is work that we get to have some credit for as well. We're all part of this kingdom work, and uh, I often say this, 
boy, we're going to get into heaven someday, and uh, there's going to be a lot of people, uh, if you've been faithful, if you have given, if you've prayed, that, uh, y- that you get to rejoice with because of the salvation that they have received. So let's pray, and we'll receive this offering. Father, we're so very grateful for this time, this day. Thank you for the message that uh, our brother gave this evening. Lord, it certainly stirred my heart, and I pray that you would continue to stir my heart that, Lord, I would have a, a greater desire and I would see the, uh, the harvest is already white. Lord, send me out as a laborer, uh, whether it's Africa or whether it's this community right here in Greece and Parma and Monroe County. Uh, Lord, may we make a gospel difference in this world. Lord, I pray that your face would shine down upon the Jelowick family that you would guide and direct their steps. Certainly they have a plan and a path they want to go down, but Lord, we pray that you would open up and close doors uh, through thy Holy Spirit, through your work. Thank you for the generosity and the faithfulness of the givers of this church. God, would you reward them tenfold, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure Dan and Jan are going to stand around, hang out for a little while. If you have any questions, um, do you guys have any cards or anything like that you brought with you? Probably not. No. You can always find them on Facebook or something like that, but uh, they'll be around. You can talk to them, ask them any questions that you might have. Thank you, everyone, for being here. You guys are dismissed.